Hello, everyone. We are waiting for people to join us. Uh, just a couple more minutes and then we'll get started. Welcome, everyone. You can see everyone's introducing themselves in the chat. Feel free to say where you're from in the chat. That would be wonderful. Okay, we're a couple of minutes after starting time, so I will uh, welcome everybody. Hello, my name is Vivian Glantz, and I will be the facilitator for today's session. And it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you to our third Global Green Spotlight series, Green International Action, Think Global, Act Local. Local. Now we hope this webinar will provide you with the opportunity to learn, engage and understand what is involved when working with the international greens community. <clears throat> Before I start, I would like to remind everyone that we are providing live interpretation today from English into Spanish and French. And to activate this in Zoom, click the interpretation button on the bottom right side of your screen, the global icon that you can probably see there and select your language. And I'd love to say thank you so much to Andrea, Enrique, Beth and uh, Jose and Mathilde for volunteering your time to make this event possible as our interpreters. Now, many organizations start meetings with an acknowledgement of country to recognize our First Nations people who have been the custodians of this land for thousands of years. Now we certainly do that here in Australia. Uh, I'm coming to you from the land of the Wajak Noongar people in the southwestern part of Australia. Uh, at this point in time, we see how sovereignty over country is extremely important. And I'd like to take this moment to acknowledge First People all over the world and express my deepest sympathies for those who have had their country taken away from them. Of course, an acknowledgement is only a first step and needs to be followed by action. And we have several sessions focused on indigenous issues in the program. And we are also starting an indigenous working group. So today we acknowledge first peoples as custodians of the country from which we join this online conference. We pay our respects to the First Nations elders and current descendants of these countries. We especially commit to that part of our work as Greens that is guided and led by Indigenous people in, in redressing past injustice and preserving current Indigenous custodianship of the land. I welcome all of those who identify as First Nations peoples to our conference today, or to our session today. Thank you. I'll just give you a quick overview of uh, what we're going to be doing. What makes us unique as Greens is that we are the only global organization working together for an environmentally and socially just world. With 100 plus Greens parties worldwide, as well as members of parliament, foundations, think tanks and individuals, we have a unique opportunity to share knowledge and solidarity with one another. It is why this month we bring you an expert panel of speakers and activists to share their experience of working in the International Greens movement. As you are all well aware, we are a globalized world and as a result, we must strike a balance between thinking globally 
and acting locally. It's webinars like this that remind us why the Global Greens exist, to bring us all together and discuss important issues that face our world. And we're delighted to welcome five wonderful speakers who will be joining us tonight to share their insights. I'll just give you a brief overview. We'll be hearing from uh, Melanie Chapman, who is a former international coordinator from the Green Party of Aotearoa, New Zealand, who will provide us with an understanding of developing an international strategy. Uh, Pega Edelatian, who's from the German Greens, who will provide us with an understanding of her role as an international coordinator. Then we'll be joined by Lucy Kagendo and Snigla Tuwari, who are the current conveners of the Global Greens COP27 Working Group, and they'll provide a case study of global organizing. And finally, Mohamed Awed, who is the president of the Egyptian Greens and vice president of the African Greens Federation, who will talk about COP27, which will take place in Sharma al-Sheikh in Egypt. So without further ado, I would like to welcome our first speaker. Now, Melanie Chapman is the former international secretary uh, for six years for the Greens Party of Aotearoa in New Zealand. As part of her role, she sat on the national executive of the party. Melanie was also the New Zealand councillor to the Asia Pacific Greens Federation. She is an experienced consultant in international development, public administration, and a former New Zealand diplomat. Melanie is a strong advocate of Green Party's learning from and sharing with each other to strengthen their own organizations, political ambitions, and the Global Green Movement. Thank you, Melanie, over to you. Thank you, Vivian, and uh, greetings to the Global Green family. I'm really excited to be your first speaker this evening. Um, I'm sorry about the PowerPoint, but it may well take uh, may, may well make it easier for folk to follow um, the presentation. So what I'm going to do tonight is um, focus on what the Green Party of New Zealand did to um, build and strengthen our um, capacity to engage international. It's still a work in progress, uh, but we've managed to make some advances uh, and deliver on some of the strategy which we um, set up uh, almost a couple of years ago now. So first slide, thank you. So I'll be very much taking a bit of an organizational focus. Uh, so just a, a, a little bit of context uh, for people that may not be so familiar with the New Zealand system. We're a mixed member proportional system, uh, a bit like the German electoral system, but with Westminster tra traditions. Um, the Green Party has been a part of government for the past two electoral terms, um, and currently we hold uh, to our co-leaders hold ministerial positions in the current government by a special arrangement with the centre-left Labour Party. Uh, generally, in the last two elections, we achieve between sort of six and eight percent of the overall vote. And when thinking about in the New Zealand system, um, our diaspora many of whom are eligible to vote when they're living, studying or working abroad. Um, and as a general rule, we get significantly more um, percentage of people that vote green from abroad than would actually domestically. Uh, and we do have a lot of our population as a proportion that do live abroad. Next slide, thanks. So one of the, re as I mentioned earlier, one of the reasons um, we thought that setting up a strategy um, to really be a bit more deliberate about how we engage internationally. Previously, it was, um, it was a bit more, uh, shall we say, organic and fluid about the way that we worked internationally. But there was a lot of opportunity to be a bit more deliberate about how we went about building our international connections. So in summary, when, when we set up the strategy, we focused on three main areas. So I guess 
in order to deliver on what we wanted to deliver, we needed to really strengthen our party. So that was um, around um, retaining and growing our overseas membership of New Zealanders living abroad um, and also working on our system strategies and processes to actually make that engagement from New Zealand to our diaspora members and supporters much easier than it, than it had been previously. Still a work in progress. Also, um, a really important pillar was getting out the overseas vote, um, making sure that, that our, that our uh, fellow country people are well aware that there are elections on, how they might be enrolled if they're not already, are they eligible, and also to persuade them to vote green. We've done that every election cycle, but it hasn't been, it's not been necessarily um, strategic and it has been delivered by volunteers. We're integrating a lot more into the main part of the campaign. And for the first time this year, we hope to be a bit more engaged um, through the, our local uh, local government elections with our, with our supporters abroad. And the third pillar was around, um, recommitting to our um, to our international green structures, you know, it's a global greens, the Asia Pacific greens, but also actually being um, working with like minded parties a lot more about political strategy, um, sharing um, party organizational um, uh, uh, capability learnings and all those sorts of sharings. So that's the general uh, overview of our strategy. Uh, sorry, just the forward slide, thanks a lot. Um, so why did we have a strategy? I think I, I touched on it before, but um, we need to better understand what our membership and supporters were wanting from the party, those that were living a abroad that were having different experiences to those living domestically. What did they care about? How did they want to support the party? Why were they engaged with us even though they weren't living in, country, in our country? Um, we also wanted to really um, support and recognize uh, a group of volunteers that had long been engaged um, who were living abroad that did support uh, election campaigns and to formalize them as a, as a network. So it was a matter of the party wrapping itself around and, and supporting that to happen. And it did happen um, last year. We also looked at removing um, barriers to participating. Um, again, a work in progress, whether it's you know, IT systems, the way that um, members abroad can engage in the party processes. Um, Again, I, I mentioned about the uh, the uh, getting out the vote and just being a bit more strategic uh, about that and embedding our um, embedding our activities within the main campaign, supporting it, resourcing it, uh, and and uh, yeah, and and also um, what we had very low capacity um, to engage in all the areas that we wanted to with the global green movement, whether it's whether it's something servicing, um, you know, Asia Pacific Greens Federation uh, committees, or whether it's supporting the activities of the global greens. We needed to build um, our capacity a bit more to do that. So we've got some activities underway for that. Um, and again, a bit being a bit more deliberate about how we work with other green parties. Um, you know, whether we work together at election at each other's election time to um, spread the word via social media or share learnings about forming coalition governments. And we've done that, I think, most recently with the Scottish Greens. Next slide. So the first pillar around party strengthening. Um, so we, I talked about the, um, the network of Aotearoa Greens Global. Um, they're not a large group, but they're active and we wanted to support them. We wanted to give them the resources around campaign time uh, to help us get the word out, 
get New Zealanders out to vote and get them out to vote green. Um, so a part of that is helping those members have a say in how the party goes about um, their, our international campaigns. That's all a, a part of the picture of formalising a network. Um, sometimes there are issues that the New Zealand diaspora has, overseas New Zealanders, uh, whether it's their status in Australia or um, visa issues, um, COVID related issues, there are particular issues. So it's actually raising awareness in New Zealand of the experiences, um, you know, whether it's within our own party or with our, um, in our headquarters or in the members of parliament. Um, we also uh, yeah, reviewed aspects of our party structures um, without going into any detail. Uh, the, we've just recently, the membership has endorsed an entirely new constitution. So working through implementing that. And I know that my successor will be looking at how uh, the international work best fits within our new constitution. Um, and What's most exciting, I think, because um, to date, most of our work um, has been funneled through the International Secretary role or the Asia Pacific Greens Councillor role. Uh, so we're looking to set up an international committee that, that gives us the breadth to engage, that helps support the party to do its international work, to guide its international work. And so that's in formation at the moment as a part of our strategy. Next slide, thanks. Okay, so a really important thing, and I know it's not available to every Green Party, not every every jurisdiction um, allows its overseas citizens to vote, but many do. Uh, and since New Zealand does, and, and the fact that the Green Party always does very well uh, from, from the overseas vote, it's worth spending time. Uh, so specifically um, for the 2023 campaign that will mean that we'll look at our learnings from the 2020 campaign uh, make sure that um, the, the the party headquarters has sufficient resourcing and funding for the campaign um, and mobilizing our volunteers and our and our uh, Aotearoa Greens global network to support us in this aim um, and it's also really important that the campaign is not seen as some satellite uh, activity, that it's really is a part of everyday thinking uh, within our domestic campaign about how the messages also uh, might be received or different messages are targeted abroad. Uh, and then also there's kind of sub campaigns. Uh, we've got diaspora in UK and Australia in particular. Uh, and so there'll be particular issues there that will be of interest um, to our diaspora in those areas. So it'll be a matter of tailoring the campaign for that. And then a new area we'll try. Um, I'll see how that goes, but um, local government elections really important in the green movement, as everyone knows. We've had a lot of success in, in local elections around the world, um, but New Zealanders living abroad uh, don't often know that, you know, you, when you're miles away and local government elections seem very far from the mind often, and it's in New Zealand, it's quite um, convoluted and paper-based for the local government elections to be involved uh, if, if you're living abroad. So there's a bit of planning involved. So for the first time, we'll, we'll try this out. Next slide, thanks. Collaborating. Now, this is where all of you come in. <laughs> um, really keen to join up. We have worked a lot in the green movement. We're obviously a part of all of our formal structures. We participate in committees. We have volunteers and women's networks and mentoring and all sorts of activities for political campaigning. Um, but one of the things that we hope to do a bit better and a bit more of is have a special relationship with the Australian Greens because of some of the familiarities between our our, um, our two countries, I guess, and a his shared history of, of sorts. Um, and there's lots of, there's a few uh, 
by um, bilateral issues that we could potentially work on. Also, um, and we do do this on a sort of ad hoc basis, but we could be a bit more deliberate about it, is to have a, a grouping of smaller, the smaller green parties with electoral systems that are similar to ours, that face similar problems, whether it's negotiating in coalitions or, um, you know, sharing about um, um, organizational issues. Um, it's been very fruitful in the past for us and for a counterpart party. So I would encourage um, a more of that within the green movement. And last slide, I think. So why strategy? I, I really encourage um, parties to think about how they could be more deliberate um, with their engagement. Um, and because there's many reasons why you might do a strategy and it's not really about the end product. It's not about the bit of paper, the document at the end of it. It's more about the process to engage with um, other decision makers within the party. You begin to build a, those conversations which um, you know, for parties that are not so outward looking, you, you naturally we're very focused um, on all of our uh, key domestic issues, um, but actually having those conversations is really um, helpful for, for the, for the organisation. Um, and also it really, it's like, well, why, what problems do we have? And it really helps you to, to target, um, you know, whether it's capacity issues to engage or whether it's knowing how where to go or who to work with, a strategy might help you work through those. Um, and also, our volunteers are precious in our party. We know that volunteers spend time, effort, and some of it, to be honest, is can be a bit wasted without the right kind of focus. So a strategy is not all the answers, but it does help guide volunteer effort. So there's less, you're less inclined to sort of waste it uh, with, with, you know, little direction. Um, I think for success, you definitely need a, a, a accountability. Um, and so a dedicated role or a group or a body that's accountable for delivering and implementing that strategy. And you also need to, so it's not forgotten in a drawer, you also need to, um, you know, report on it, remind people that, why you're doing and what you're doing and how well it's going and what we could do better next time. So um, yeah, I'm personally a big advocate of making sure that information goes back into the system about how successful or not um, our strategy is. Um, so that's maybe my case for why parties might consider a strategy if you don't already have one. Um, so thank you. Um, I look forward to hearing the next um, number of speakers. Thank you so much, Melanie. That was that was wonderful. That was very comprehensive. And having been on the periphery of some of those a few years back as this strategy was developing, it's great to see how it's going on. And just a reminder to everyone, if you do have any questions, please pop them into the Q&A. You can find it at the bottom of your screen. And we'll take some questions at the end. So um, now I would like to move on to our next speaker. We have Pega Edelatian, the international coordinator from the German Greens. Uh, Pega is the deputy federal chairwoman. And um, please excuse my pronunciation. I did do German. I will try to make sure I do German. Uh, of the Bundes Neunzig, is that right? Yeah, no, Bundes Neunzig die Grünen. Uh, since February 2022. Uh, she's the party's first diversity spokesperson and international green coordinator. Her passion lies in global justice, feminist foreign policy and human rights. Being a European at heart, she wants to shape green politics in Europe and internationally. Through projects such as the Inclusive Volunteer Service, uh, Weltwärts a la Inclusive, <laughs> <laughs> and as a political advisor for migration and flight, she has collected extensive experience in fields related to diversity. Together with the party's diversity officer and its diversity council, she intends to make the structure of Bundes Neunzig de Grönen more inclusive. Please welcome Pega. 
Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. Yes, I have two hats on. Well, I'm the uh, vice president, but I have two hats on. I'm the diversity spokeswoman and the international coordinator. And as the international coordinator, I can tell you whenever people from around the globe come together, my heart beats faster. I just love you know, the fact that there's 51 people in here and saying hi from all around the world and that we're here together right now. So thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to be here. And uh, Melanie, I just loved your PowerPoint presentation. I really have to get that from you. Um, I want to copy that to, uh, to have also focus a strategy like that. That was really, really helpful. A couple of years ago, I uh, was a delegate from the Global Greens to the uh, COP uh, in Katowice and uh, we were like a delegation group and then afterwards we made a, a PowerPoint, a, I'm saying PowerPoint, a webinar and told uh, what we what we saw, what we negotiated, what we experienced and all the people from all around the world came and we talked about climate and climate justice that was also a very, very great experience. So this is the core, you know, like Greens from all around, around the world and, and, and Europe, we come together. And my experience is that's, you no, know, I just, we had two weeks ago, EGP in Riga. And my experience is we live in total different countries. We look at each other, immediately we have a connection because we have the same values, the same vision, the same sense of justice. We're inclusive, we're feminists. So we have the same, goal. And in this way that we're going, which is not an easy way, we also experience same problems, which is really interesting. Like I always thought that the that the case that in Germany, they say, oh, Greens want to forbid everything. They're the party of, uh, of, of, of forbidding fun was some German thing. Then I would meet other colleagues and they were like, oh, no, this is this is also the case in Ireland. This is the case in this country and that country. They always want to put us into that direction. So we immediately see that we have also the same problems. So we are able to exchange uh, these problems and to find together solutions. It's already it's already good to do that. But there's also more. First of all, um, in a globalized world, is there really national politics and international politics? I would say everything that happens in my country has an influence on other countries. Things that have influence that happens in other countries have influence in my country. So it's not even in, in, in nowadays in a globalized world, it's not possible to think national. You need international solutions. To find international solutions, you need like-minded people to, to find international solutions with. When we went to the EGP, we had, uh, we had um, resolutions that we um, adapted together and we discussed together from all over, all over the Europe, from East Europe, South Europe, West Europe. So we all came together and we're like, wow, we are talking about exporting weapons to, crease, uh, to, to, to crisis countries, which is new for us as Greens. That was not our position before, but we all immediately understood that as a feminist party with a feminist foreign policy of idea, we know that self-determination is important, that we that are against colonizing politics, who are against imperialist politics, know that sometimes we have to take measures which are difficult for us, but it was so important to discuss this together and to have a resolution together on this point. And, but beyond that, also to say, well, but we're still a feminist party. We are still the Greens. We want also to have, a, to have an understanding of human security, to understand that security is in this times also really clearly self-defense with weapons, but we also need to think about the right of a person, the human right perspective of a person to live um, without fear and to live without want, to also have a more wide perspective on the issues of security. So when you have from one aspect, parties deciding on this, uh, well, the green green family deciding on this. This is important to have one language, but also supporting each other to be strong in our countries, because then the international relations will work towards the vision that we have, because we're stronger in different kind of countries. That's also the case of of um, climate issue. How we can how can we fight 
the climate crisis and get to climate justice if, if there was only the German Greens. It would be really difficult because, of course, we need the world to work on it. And of course, we need a green movement to, to work on this. So the stronger Greens are in other countries, the more I'm secure that these values, these issues like climate justice, human rights, feminist policy will get be international as a norm be the norm of international relations. So that's why as an international coordinator, I'm extremely interested in having networks, having contacts with other Greens to support the Greens in other countries so we can be strong together. And that's why, Melanie, this was so important to hear what strategies is there to actually, from the vision to go into the field and ex actually experience or actually work on what, what is important to us, to support each other. How can we support each other? Because uh, uh, two two points that that you made. I also experienced that uh, parties ask us, yes, you had a uh, you had a very uh, successful election campaign. Can you teach us uh, what to do? Or can we have some exchange thoughts on that? Or how do you negotiate things? That this this is like knowledge tra transfer, which is important between us, but also to support each other in structural growth. So this is two two points uh, which are I think uh, very uh, important that um, we uh, get networks um, from from strategic uh, perspective. Uh, so as a, as a, a coordinator, uh, I've been uh, in my position for three, four months. And uh, the first experience was uh, the, the EGP. Um, and that was um, really, uh, yes, coming together and having formulating positions and adapting them. And now I'm very interested how to, to widen this up uh, globally. Uh, so today I'm here with the Global Greens and I'm very, very interested in, in much of context between us. Uh, I am very uh, interested to hear what we can do in Egypt, uh, what the, the international conference will be next year, because uh, these, um, this, this networks and, and focusing on how do we support each other from the organization? How do we support each other's uh, position? How do we, and how to learn to get together and formulate a position is also uh, very important for the international competence of a person in a party. So I'm looking forward to that. And thank you very much. I'm very interested to hear the other parts. Thank you so much, Pega. That was very inspirational. And um, yes, you've made some, some wonderful points there and hopefully we can come back to some of those in, in the Q&A. Um, so please do pop your questions in the Q&A, uh, which we'll have a look at at the end. Um, just moving on now to our third session, which will be a joint session with Lucy Kagendo and, and Snigna Tiwari. Um, are you both there? Yep, we have uh, Lucy uh, Kagendo Mbawe, uh, uh, Mbai is currently the Gender Secretary at the Green Congress of Kenya and has held this position since 2016. Lucy is an environmental activist and program officer at the Green Dimensions Network. She's also the Global Greens Climate Working Group convener. Lucy is also running for member of County Assembly uh, to Rosambu in Nairobi County in the 2022 elections. Hope that goes really well for you. And we also have, uh, Lucy is being joined by Snigda Tiwari, the Climate Working Group co-convener as well um, of the Global Greens Climate Working Group, and also the main representative of APGF, which is the Asia Pacific Greens Federation, to the Global Greens Coordination. She is currently the counsellor from India in the age of uh, APGF, and Snigda is a human rights lawyer and climate justice activist. Snigda is also involved in her local party and is the international secretary of the Uttarakhand Parav uh, Paravartan Party in India and member of the Uttarakhand Students' Organization, which is the equivalent of the Young Greens of India. Welcome to you both. Thank you so much. So, I can have the slides, please. Yeah. Okay. So as thank you so much as the introduction, my name is Lucy 
Kagendo um, from Kenya. And it's good to see all of you. I'll just be able to share just a little bit about what we are doing. So uh, you can go to the last, you did a bit of the introduction. So can you go to the next slide, please? So I'll just jump in into the work that we are doing as a climate working group. And so the Global Greens Network is a working group which has forums to promote more effective worldwide communications among the green parties. And the green parties, I mean, they are all over the uh, continent and movements. It's a network which has a number of individuals and groups that come together for a common purpose. Well, as a working group comes together is to carry out a defi defi defined task. So in this case, the working group is more on the climate working group. And that is what we are going to be talking about. So the Global Greens Climate Working Group was formed last year before COP26. And I take this opportunity to thank the first co-convenance that was Alice and Anne-Marie. Next slide, please. So the mandates, what our mandates are the working group. So the working, the climate working group conveners will convene the working group to organize and guide the green groups globally to be the most effective influence at, during the COP meetings, which usually happens once a year. And we have been privileged, personally, I've been there, like I've attended three COPs. And it has been a good time where you just meet all of you and be able to just deliberate about the climate change in different parts of the world. So that is the mandate. During these, I mean, the mandate also, we are able to come up with the different people. We have different groups in those among, I mean, within the working group, we usually get different people who are able to do different things. Volunteer, we have those who decide to do the strategic paper, they can do communications. We have those who decide to do, just to be observers. And I mean, we need all those people on board so that we can be able to have a successful working group. And even as we look forward to COP27, be able to, have a productive and have the Global Greens uh, word out there and be heard, which is our purpose as political parties in the world. Next slide, please. So what is COP? Okay, I know most of you know about it, but we, decide, we decided to just explain about it a little bit for those who don't know. So COP is the conference of parties known as COP is the decision-making body responsible for monitoring, reveal, and implementation of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. It brings together 197 nations and territories called parties that have signed to the Framework Convention accredited observers, and that's where we come in as observers as Global Greens. And also we also have the press so we also, during this time, during COP, usually have the Paris Agreement, which is actually one of the main people that came up. So just a definition for those who don't know what is the Paris Agreement. It's often referred to as a Paris Accords today, or the Paris Climate Accords in an international treaty on climate change, adopted in 2015. And it covers just climate change, mitigation, adaptations, and finance. So that's when the different parties sit down and now they come back and negotiate on different, based on those, what the Paris Agreement, that is what happens during the COP. Next slide, please. So what happens there? During the COP, we have various events for those who have been able to attend. I was, we were hoping you do just a bit of videos, but if you go back to actually even on the Global Greens, uh, website and also the Facebook page. You can be able to see there are different times during COP, there are usually different things that are happening. As Global Greens, we usually have different events. We have dinners where we meet all of us, we have papers, we get to just focus on what's happening during COP. 
So during, we have the various events by different stakeholders exhibiting and discussing issues around the climate change. And the last two COPs we have been, we have seen actually matches calling on the different parties. And I, I can say, I mean, it has been a success if you have been following on the Fridays for Futures and we have been able actually as the Global Greens rejoining and we are, you know, it's not like we are happy of what is happening. Like the COP26, we left very unhappy because, you know, the things that we were expecting to happen could not happen. And I think during those matches, we, I mean, people are able to just talk and let the world know what we, I mean, what the expectations of the people, which I think is very good during that time. So also the climate working group sends delegates as observers to follow the events during the COP. And they also organize the side effects, just like I said, to just discuss on different things during that time and the implementations that are taking place. Next slide. So uh, you asked a question, how do I take global issues of climate change and work through those in the group? So on a personal level, as Lucy, I'm a woman, a mother, an environmental artist, activist, member of Green Congress, I'm a politician, secretary to the Women Affairs, GCK, know the benefits of the climate policies are very important and determine the levels and type and timing of policies that the government should understand to address climate change. Auxiliary benefits and costs of the greenhouse gas mitigations policies can best be defined as effects that are additional to direct reductions of the GHS. Climate change is not just changing our weather as most of us think, it is the consequences that are daily reality to millions of people around the world and more in Africa, where I come from. I have been in Kenya, so I can share more about my Kenyan experience. So that's what I'll share about. So, so but when, so like I said, it's not just the climate change, the different, it's not about change of climate of the different seasons, but when the intense rains fall more frequently, causing floods or spells of drought, Last several years, it is usually women and girls that struggle to survive and recover from the aftermath. This is because women and girls already face inequalities and discrimination because of the gender which compound and multiply when disasters strike. I know this is more, I mean, it relates maybe across all the parts of the world, but this is a Kenyan and African way, the Global South experience. From my work and experience, I know that the climate change related crises are already instigating deep life alternating changes for some of the poorest and most marginalized women and girls in the world. And in Kenya, to be more precise, just to outline just a few of what we are facing. So I'll say first is increased risk for the violence against women and girls in a camp just imagine that's just a scenario I'm gonna explain. So you can imagine in a camp for displaced people in Kenya or somewhere in the global south, where girls and women, two sisters lie awake at night, listening to any sounds that may alert them to men walking into their makeshift shelters, which has no proper dolls. I mean, if you have been able to look at the different the refugee camps, you can be photos, you can be able to relate to that. Some nights they do not sleep at all for the fear of being attacked. They feel insecure because we, where they are come from, I mean, the shelters are very poor. Sometimes the thieves come in and try to harm them. It's scary. The thieves do not want to take any material things and they want to harm women. So that's why they do not look for out for things. They just want to attack the women. Next slide, please. So the next one is the increased risk of child marriage. It sounds so small, but you can imagine what the global south of the Kenyan women are going through. When the floods Kenya, in Kenya, the girls and women suddenly have to face the prospect of getting married at the tender age of 14. The parents are struggling after they losing everything in the floods 
and they feel they feel that the marriage into another family would keep the girls and women well fed and safe. In some places, they are considered as a, considered an extra burden in times of crisis. For poor families who have lost their homes, the life roots, children marriage can be seen as a ticket out, or at least a way to diminish the effects of the clip in poverty. Whilst all this is ensuring the perceived security of their daughters from the violence. I'll share the, the third one, which is more likely to miss classes or drop out of schools. I mean, even as we focus on the girl child and the African girls goes to school, those are challenges that we find here. So in Kenya, during droughts or floods, sometimes girls miss classes, even though they love going to school and know the, the benefits of going to school. In times of crisis, girls are often forced to drop out of school or miss classes because household pressures at home. Girls are often enlisted to take care of family members or help in, with domestic chores, such as cooking, cleaning, and finding water. And school is considered a lower priority in terms of needs during these times. Sometimes, the old schools are destroyed in crisis or even closed for longer periods. So we can imagine those are the effects of the climate change that we are facing in Africa or in, the, or in Kenya, more precise where I come from. The next one, please. So they have just to, to share about, then we can conclude. So the fourth one is increased risk of death and injury marginalized women and girls. The disabled and the elderly are more vulnerable to death and injury in the face of natural disasters. Due to their traditional given rules as caretakers, these are the women and girls, often stay back in disaster to protect their children or adults in their care, while men sometimes escape. Not only that, but deeply ingrained social norms sometimes dictate that women girls sometimes have to wait on permission from the men in the household to leave their houses. That is happening. In some places, women are also often unable to escape when caught up in sudden floods, droughts, or earthquakes, as they are not encouraged to learn to swim and protect themselves. So the last one is it affects the availability of food and chances of earning a living. So imagine that you live in a pastoral or farming community and food, and the food you eat every day comes from the crops that you grow daily or the livestock you rear for milk, meat for selling in return for cash so that you can be able to get other supplies. Now imagine in the same land you rely on, slowly dries out or gets inundated with water and destroys a season of worth of crops. So what happened? This is the reality facing African girls whose parents are pastorates or live on the farm to produce for animals and food for them. So I can go on and on as a woman, mother, environmental activist member. I mean, there's so much to share about. And I always say, I mean, it was a chance, good chance being the, on the global working group to share just more on the challenges on the women. I'm a woman, that's why I focus so much on the women. And I'm sure even during these COPs, you have all these groups that come different people are coming. We have the indigenous people, we have the women groups. I mean, facing, and like I say, every, country is facing, we are unique in different ways, the things that, the troubles that we face. The last one, before Sikida comes in. And that's why I am always calling for collective action. We have one half, and if we do not take care of it now, it will treat us differently. And that's our core business and discussion in the Climate Working Group. As a working group, we have come up with strategic paper that is to guide us as we gear towards COP27 in Egypt. And we call on, all, on more members to participate with the help of the members of the working group. We are able to do much. The last. So 
So what are the challenges? Of course, it's not easy uh, coming up. I mean, there are, the, there are the pros and cons during, I mean, forming the group. It's a great place we enjoy, it, like we are just doing sitting up and just talking about climate change as global, as green parties in different parts of the world. But it's always, I mean, we don't miss that challenge a bit. So of course we have the time differences. I'm sure even like now we could not attend because of the different zones where we come from. We have different challenges facing each member countries. Like I was saying, I talked about my Kenyan experience. Sekida will talk about us. Mohammed will do the same. So different countries do the same. And also we have the language, but we always thank God that we have the interpreters that are always there to help us with that. So Sekida can share a bit more. Thank you so much, Lucy. Well, it was very comprehensive and very moving, I must say, with the, the situations that you've described there. Um, we are running very um, close to our final time. Snikda, did you have anything to add? Yes, uh, thank you. I'll just, uh, I, I understand minutes, our session. Our session went on for quite some time. I'll just elaborate more on the challenges. Lucy already explained what COP is and what is our aim, particularly as the Global Greens Climate Working Group Pro Conveners. So what we are trying to achieve uh, is on international building of movements, of green movements from across the globe. We have received some very good suggestions in this webinar uh, from everyone, and we are trying to work upon that. Like, for example, the challenges that we face in building up of these movements is basically we see less representation from the global south when we uh, when we attended COP26 last year, we saw there was uh, numerous uh, restrictions because of vaccine distribution irregularities and a lot of delegates from the global south, particularly from Africa or Asia could not attend. Then multiple times with Greens, even we have, uh, we have organized um, congresses, we have, uh, we have tried to participate, like increase participation, particularly of the global south uh, in bond climate conference which is going on just now so what we see is there is visa restrictions that we face there are multiple other things so these the voices of the global south which are actually facing the brunt of climate change right now is not there if we are not there in the policy making why we are important as a climate working group of global greens and how we are developing and focusing on the aim that we have is to collaborate transnationally with all green movements uh, is to like trying to connect all these dots from Germany to India to Kenya to somewhere in uh, to like somewhere in uh, America. So these dots we are trying to connect. We are facing our challenges, as Lucy correctly said, uh, for like it's time zone, it is language differences. But then we we are working through it. And what basically we have to understand through this uh, webinar and what is my important message is that we need to understand the support from global to local we say like we we have this motto of uh, like think globally act locally so how do we send that support from global to local we have many green movements active everywhere in india we are active in uttarakhand we are active we are active in germany we are active everywhere else but then what is the role of global greens in that and how we can extend that support for example Mohammed was yesterday saying in a meeting that how like uh, what is there for Egyptian greens and that the COP is happening in Egypt. So how can greens strengthen the local movement and have an impact there? And as uh, as Melanie rightly said that we need to have bilateral, you know, between two greens country, we need to have campaigns, we need to have a specific, uh, like we need to run on those campaigns and think about those campaigns. So all these points are very important and maybe let's try to develop something, some support system which we can flow, which can flow from global to local, maybe in terms of knowledge sharing or in terms of capacity building, community building, impacting those particular country where greens are present, present, like international greens are present. We will be present in Egypt. We will be present in the Congress next year. So how can we strengthen the green movement in for that country, for that locality, and then you know take everyone together globally for conferences like cop 27 so this is all that i have to say thank mm. you we took thank a lot you. of time today thank you snigda i love your passion too that's really good well done and and you raised some really interesting points there about that um uh, capacity building and it takes us right back to what melanie was saying and also pega um and and lucy about how we support one another 
Now, uh, we only have a few minutes left, but I'd love to just hand over to our final speaker, uh, Mohammed Awad, who is the president of the Egyptian Green Party and second vice president of the African Greens Federation and Global Greens delegate to COP26. Now, Mohammed holds a BSc in chemical engineering and a BA in law from Cairo University and a master's of law from the Institut des droits des affaires internationales. Mohammed has been integral to the Egyptian Green Party, having been a member since the party first launched in 1990. Congratulations, Mohammed. Um, having served as the former member of Egyptian Parliament in the Upper House, International Affairs and National Security Committee between 2012 and 2013. Mohammed has extensive experience in international affairs. Now, Mohammed, you're going to tell us a little bit about what's coming up with COP27. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Vivian, for that introduction. And uh, I really uh, thank you for having me in this webinar among those distinguished green leaders. Uh, for sure, I'm expecting everyone asking what's the plan of the Egyptian Green Party for a COP27, which will held in Egypt. Uh, it, it's not the right time or a right place to talk about the details, but I would like to tell you that uh, already we have a past experience with the organization or the plan approach of Glasgow and the President Cubs. And I'm just keep everybody relaxed that Sharm el Sheikh is a tourist, is a city for tourists, and very well lectures. So it will be a good trip there. But I'm talking and focus on the COP27. For sure, during Glasgow, I have seen a lot of things. And one of the major points in my mind, our target to participate in the COPs. COPs everywhere is very, very well known to everybody. That COPs, it means the green. So our targets always and will still how to influence on the decision making in a COP. That was my first concern on, a, on Glasgow Congress. We have done everything possible to influence in the decision making coming from COP26. And I remember very well, ahead of the Congress, I said, or I make a word to everyone, that we may be not able to achieve what we want. Myself, I have done a mistake. I read a small, a very short news, was talking at that time about some negotiation and agreement between the leaders of the North Globe with some countries in the South Globe. I really, I, I read this news, but I didn't pay much attention for it. But during the Congress, I discovered what happened. At the last day of the Congress, I discovered what happened. And that's make me currently Rethink about our approach at the Green, how we will be able to make an influence in the decision making of COP27. Actually, we shouldn't expect that a decision is making there during the Congress itself. A decision actually is making ahead of that. And that means that our activities, our events, should come ahead of the Congress, at least two months. That's the time where the governments, the official governments all over the world make their deeds. In my mind, I'm thinking that we have a plan B different than that 
traditional approach. We have to start our plan two months ahead of COP27. We have to have a specific demands during these two months to request the official leaders of the world to pay much attention for. The events during the Congress itself just to confirm the president demands and then to get sure that they are following. We have many tools in our hand to stress on. And we have many tools to pressure on. We know what happened exactly in Glasgow. And I give you just one small example. Japan, as a one of the G7, till the moment, they did not sign Glasgow Declaration. That's one of our things. And we have many and many others. We're reviewing the speeches of the official of each country during Glasgow 27. And attentionally, they panned us to listen to the first day to the speeches of the president. Why? Yes, simply because this speech is actually what's representing their strategy. But the details, last rule, the negotiation after that, it would be very difficult to understand because we missing the strategy of each country. Participation is a cop is a very strong tool to focus on our demands, to put a pressure on the governments, different governments, to follow what we need, what we ask them to do. I know very well that human rights issue it's a case in Egypt. But I let you know, if we are not going to participate strongly in a COP27, that will make the human rights issue in Egypt more severe. We have to keep this point in our mind. I would like to call your attention for more important problem for all of us as a group. COP28, as far as I know, it's planned to be held in United Arab Emirates. That means that we have two cops in successive in the same region. Two cops in successive in South Globe. With a difference between rich country and poor country. We have to pay much attention for that. We have to pay much attention. United Arab Emirates system, the political system there, not allowing for political parties. It means that United Arab Emirates has no Green Party. And that will make a people and the region make a comparison between the success of the COP28 in Emirates that has no Green Party and Egypt in COP27 that has a Green Party, a national Green Party. That will be the comparison on public level. We have to pay much attention for that. By the end, I would like to say, Egyptian Green as a national Green of the Hussein country will not sing a different song that's performing by all the international Greek. We are part and will not act as a separate, as outside of the flux. But we have to pay much attention for the issues that I refer to. And at last, I would like to call your attention 
how the Egyptian people think for the Greek. We have a story, all the story. 1986, I think, or 87. We read in the newspaper a news of three, four lines saying that a people in Germany slept on the railways trying to stop passing of a train which carrying a radiated, polluted parcel of foods to Egypt. And here, our people asked at that time, why are those people doing that? And over three years till now, we're telling them the reason that's agree. We think globally and we act locally. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mohammed. That's very powerful words there. And, and I think that call out for us to um, be prepared, I think, is, is really what, what you were saying, that we have to work within the structures of the COP, um, but also get ahead of it and make sure that we are a very strong part of that conversation. As you say, climate change is a Greens issue, has been for decades. So let's keep, keep pushing them in the right direction for climate action. Now, we do have some questions in the Q&A. Um, we are running a little bit over time. So uh, I will quickly go to one or two of these questions. Um, uh, I may not get to all of the panelists to answer them. And I notice a lot of people are putting your contact details down into the chat. So I'm sure there's that's lots of people want to stay in touch with us, which is absolutely fantastic. So I uh, hope uh, somebody's making a note of the chat. That would be great. Um, the first question is a more generalized question, but I think it's still very, very important as many of you have touched on these issues and all issues with climate mitigation adaptation are interlinked. Social classes, gender, and also religions are the main factors in attracting voters who live outside New Zealand. So it's probably attracted to you, Melanie. How far do you see the appropriate strategy and ap applicable policies in dealing with these factors in the party? Mm. I'm not sure I entirely understand that question, Vivian. Um, unless anyone else has got any insight, I, I think, is it asking about, is it stating why New Zealanders live outside of New Zealand? And if so, I disagree with that statement. Um, so hence my confusion. Maybe. Maybe it's attracting people to live in New Zealand. Ah, uh, okay. Potentially. That may be how it, it should be read. Uh, it's attracting people who live outside to New Zealand. Uh, so if we could, let's take this as a general question. Um, I think so. To, I'm, I'm, I'm very I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm, I'm not entirely no. what the questioner was asking of me. So if it's a general question, how do we integrate, I suppose, social class, gender and uh, religious affiliations into a climate conversation, perhaps, maybe as we are looking it at this question? I'll let our climate activists answer that one then. Pega, is this something you might like to, to ask, answer? Um, I don't know what religion exactly has to do with it. Like uh, social class, uh, of course, I would say that uh, green politics has some um, core values, and um, we say that you have when you talk about um, transition, just transition. Um, you always have to see the, eco uh, the ecological transition with the social transition. We want to think both together. We talk about a global, social, ecological transformation. That's uh, social class. And I think uh, uh, the issue of gender as a feminist, it's always about uh, self-determination, about uh, gender rights, which uh, LGBTIQ rights, which is also uh, a core value of, of the Greens and should be always addressed. Um, what the religion part is, I don't know. Um, what what religion has to do with it? I don't. 
I don't <laughs> thank you no worries yes there, there are various religious movements that are bringing uh, care for the world and nature into a religious context which I think is to be welcomed um, and there are also many religions um, where this has been happening for centuries too <laughs> so I'm sure Snigda could talk about that <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, I was about to raise my hand to answer that question. Uh, but yes, I think Nick uh, can quite uh, cover it to some extent that when I see this question, I see it uh, with the perspective of intersectionality and how that plays a role in climate negotiations, whether it be a religious minority, say in India or in Arab countries or in any other country, or whether it be a person coming from particular community, whether it be about tribal rights or about gender rights, about all these representations. So all these intersectionality play a very important role in climate negotiation. We see difference. Uh, for example, I take COVID crisis, right? When we read about COVID crisis in um, America, we see how it impacted one particular, um, like one particular people, how it impacted women more, how it impacted people of color more because of lack of resources at their end, like, like less financial incomes in all those ways. So I think uh, if we see religion, gender, all these things, we have to see it in with the approach which Greens normally have, like make it more inclusive and have their say, have their representation. And they should be part uh, of uh, like, you know, uh, they should be at the table, at, they should be at policy making level as we normally say. So <laughs> that is how I will answer this question. Thank you. I've got a, a question here that perhaps is a little provocative, but I hope, I hope it. Uh, in some ways, it actually is quite a good one because we're trying to work within the UN global pro processes, um, and this is: Are we ready to bypass the glacial UN processes and be what is called a climate hacktivist, uh, which is a bit more of a sort of radical activism? And obviously, the Greens have been known to be activists very much. So are there any thoughts on how we balance those two uh, approaches to climate activism? Mohammed, would you like to unmute? Yeah, thank you for your questions. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I remember that we, ahead of COP26, there was one of our virtual webinars uh, the Egyptian Green use one of the proposal that sex is important to serve the targets that you are asking for. We were looking for an occasion for sure, an occasion of the crisis or the conflicts among Egypt, Sudan, and Serbia for water. We introduced our vision as a green to the issue because it's not a regional issue. It is an issue everywhere. China with India, Turkey, Syria, and Iraq, United States of America with Mexico, with Mexico. This is the same. And according to that, we introduced one of our proposals that a water issue, actually, it is a uh, climate issue. It is not a resources issue. And that has a lot of implication from international law, from the attitude of every country, all of this. That was a proposal that all the Egyptians like it, by the way. And we may need to focus on that proposal again during COP27 to get to, to send our message to the humanity everywhere that green are not limiting to criticism of something against the environment. Green has their own resolution. That's our message. Thank you. That would be a wonderful activist approach to take. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <clears throat> well, look, we are uh, 15 minutes over time, and I do thank everybody for staying with us. And um, uh, I hope that uh, we have shown uh, the, the wonderful work that the Global Greens is doing. And this brings us really to the end of this webinar. I'd love to thank all of our speakers who shared such important insights with us. I'd also like to thank our volunteer interpreters who ensure we have an accessible event where language isn't a barrier to participation. And finally, to those 
Uh, wanting to know where to next? Well, have a look at the Global Greens website, but you're also welcome to donate to the Global Greens. We are a volunteer organization and we survive on contributions from member parties and from wonderful supporters and donors. So thank you all once again for joining us tonight. Um, please take care and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Everyone. Thank you.